Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we're going to wrap the week, focus on how the markets have evolved from last Friday to this Friday. I would argue this week has been about the distribution phase. It's all about how markets have rotated from more of an upward phase to more of a downward phase, really getting punctuated with the sell-off into the close uh, today on Friday. Overall, much more of a move towards risk off than risk on. We're going to look at some of the evidence together. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Reb in Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the action in the markets. We focus on the trends, inflection points, rotations, and I would argue this week, our cup runneth over with all of the above. And we've talked about the persistent uptrend in the market. We've talked about the S&P and the NASDAQ continuing to make new all-time highs, including this week but now starting to show real signs of distribution. There have been signs of, uh, you know, warning signs along the way, the weakening breadth characteristics, uh, you know, rotation in leadership, some of the cyclical sectors really struggling, the emerging uh, trend in some of the defensive sectors like real estate. But this week, especially at the end of the week, we're starting to see a bit of a rotation to the downside. I think now is the time as we uh, wrap this week and start thinking about next week and beyond, Thinking about the downside potential, what levels, particularly on, on holdings, not just the S&P, but also on uh, holdings in your portfolio, think about the potential downside and where you need to get defensive, raise cash, and so forth. Now, we have great guests on the show, as always. I uh, had a lot of fun this week with uh, with our guest, Christopher Mullen, yesterday. I had a lot of fun talking about stocks versus bonds and, uh, and the financial sector. Coming up next week, we have some great guests as well. On Tuesday, the 20th, we have Dale Pinkert from Forex Analytics on Wednesday, the 21st, Ari Wald from Oppenheimer. On Thursday, the 22nd, Jonathan Krinsky from Baycrest Partners. Also, I will be hosting the next episode of The Pitch, which is coming up July 27th. So go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch to learn more about that upcoming episode and who will be participating. Two other things to point out. Uh, number one, I will be hosting my next webcast for market misbehavior. This is coming up next Tuesday. We will be discussing what I call the bull market top checklist. I would argue the distribution we're seeing today and through much of this week is not a, a, a brand new phenomenon. We've seen some of these patterns really leading up to uh, what we've seen today. And, uh, and we're going to look at sort of the checklist, how you can identify when a bull market may be exhausted and the things along the, uh, the way to pay attention to. If you're interested in that free event, go to my website, marketmisbehavior.com slash market top, and you can find more information. Also today, we're just wrapping up our week our mid-year outlook here on Stock Charts TV called Charting the Second Half. Go to our YouTube channel, also our Stock Charts TV on-demand platform at stockchartstv.com to see all of the fantastic content. Let's continue on and wrap this week. Uh, what we're going to do is start with the poll. We always have a poll running on our Stock Charts TV live stream on our website, uh, also on our YouTube channel, other social media. We'll distribute that as well. Appreciate you answering the poll anytime you see it. Uh, helps us to have a good dialogue about the markets together. What well, we asked you recently, which of these ETFs do you think performs best through year-end 21? And the choice was U.S. stocks, global developed stocks, or EFA, and global emerging stocks, uh, EM, or dollar sign EEM. So three ETFs, the Spiders, EFA, or EM. 71% of you answered the U.S. market, the SPY. Only 13% said EFA, 15% said a margin market. So pretty much a 70-30 split between U.S. and non-U.S. You know, we've talked about the strength in the dollar and how that's emerged, you know, going quickly to the uh, to the chart of the dollar here. You know, the strength in the dollar is really the story there, I would, uh, I would argue, right? The U.S. outperforms or tends to outperform when it's a stronger dollar environment. This period, especially last year, we had the weaker dollar. It's tough to really justify. That's a huge headwind for U.S. outperformance. And you saw EM and others uh, you know, emerging, uh, pun intended, with uh, with some renewed strength. That's changed, though. You've had this bottoming process in the dollar that's really been going on for quite a while, but especially the rotation higher here in the last uh, six to eight weeks. That's where we've really seen the ratio of U.S. versus uh, the SPY versus ACQUI or something, which is a global index. You can really see the rotation 
out uh, of the non-U.S. markets and into the U.S. markets. And I, I think that is a justifiable answer. I probably would have voted uh, about the same thing. Let's continue on with our Wrap the Week segment. So what we love to do is focus on a couple of things. Number one, we'll focus on what happened with the markets actually today. We'll take a step back and look at the weekly returns. Then we'll finish off looking at the uh, Mindful Investor live chart list to break down some of the major themes with price, breadth, and sentiment. So earlier in the, in the day here, as I was writing a note to uh, my own clients, we were talking about the distributive pressures, right? That the one thing we've not really seen is a broad distribution in price on the major averages, but all the other signals I would argue of risk off have been played out before this week or into this week. And it was enough for me to, you know, have, have more of a bearish title to the report and, and, and everything. And when I'm looking at the chart of the S&P 500, you can see midday still sort of choppy, right? We opened higher, but sort of traded lower, but it really accelerated to the downside in the afternoon. You could see a, a clear rotation from more rotational to more defensive. Utilities, the number one sector, up 1%, while some of the cyclicals like financials, materials, and energy really dragging down. And it wasn't just growth versus value because the value stuff, uh, things like uh, uh, you know financials, materials down, but also some of the more growthy sectors like technology, consumer discretionary down as well. So this was much less about growth or value. This was much more about risk on versus risk off and people rotating away from sort of the offense of the market into more of the defense of the market. So the S&P finished down uh, three quarters of a percent to 43.27. The NASDAQ 100, about the same. There's no real difference between those two. Mid caps and small caps pushing further to the downside with the small cap index. The S&P 600 down the most, about 1.4%. The VIX is back above 18, which it's been below for quite a while now. Looking at some other asset classes very quickly, interest rates actually uh, bounced out of the open, but settled right back down with the 10-year yield uh, settling in right around 1.3%. At the close, the dollar index above, uh, up just a bit, but not uh, not too dramatically. Other asset classes, you actually saw a rotation uh, away from precious metals uh, as well. So uh, again, this is where I caution people to not oversimplify. We love to think, you know, isn't gold a safe haven? So if stocks come down, then gold is probably going up because that's where people would rotate to. Not necessarily. And, and I can show you plenty of times where that actually happens and plenty of times where it does not. Today is one where it did not. So the GLD was down about 1%, silver down 2.5%. Commodities overall sort of mixed, though, with some of them uh, rotating back to the upside. Cryptocurrencies did continue to be incredibly volatile, but Bitcoin actually finishing uh, in, the, uh, in the positive for the last 24-hour stretch, uh, just below 32,000 right now in Ethereum flat for the day. On the sector side, just very quickly, as I mentioned, this is very much a risk off over risk on with these consumer staples, real estate all positive today in the top four. Healthcare also uh, in the positive and the really uh, the offense, the things that you would be uh, you would be buying into, expecting the next leg higher, really feeling the weight today. So it was certainly a, a move more toward the defensive side of the coin. Let's look at the one week returns here. So we're actually taking it from last Friday here from the ninth, and we're looking at the next five trading days. And let's look uh, let's look what happened here. So in black with the S and P five hundred, which finished the week down about 0.9 percent, uh, almost exactly the same returns of the Nasdaq one hundred, which was in a very similar uh, pattern, closed the week down one percent. Three things underperformed this week. It was the crude oil down two and a half percent. We're using the USO for that. In purple, we have small cap stocks down five percent. We're using the IWM, the Russell two thousand uh, ETF for that one. And then at the bottom in blue, we have Bitcoin, which finished down 5.6%. A couple of things outperformed uh, stocks. Again, the S&P was down 0.9%. Flat for the week, just above the zero line was emerging markets. The EEM, which was up 0.1%, uh, also up 0.1% uh, gold using the GLD. In green, we have the dollar up 0.7%. And the best of the bunch, bonds up 1.2%. You know, it's interesting. We were talking with uh, Christopher Mullen yesterday on the show, uh, which is a great discussion. I'd encourage you to go check that out. Uh, if you missed it, but we talked a lot about stocks versus bonds. And it was interesting as he was pointing out the stock to bond ratio really starting to favor bonds in, in recent weeks. And what a what a difference that chart has uh, has made. I mean, because really starting at the March low, it's been, uh, you know, stocks over bonds by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it's actually on the Mindful Investor Live chart list. We could actually go right there. Here we go. You know, if you look, this is what the chart has looked like for the last couple of years. Start the clock at the March uh, 2020 market low. And with a couple pullbacks along the way, overall, it has clearly been favoring uh, stocks over bonds. It really accelerated there in the fourth quarter of last year. 
into the first, really the first half of this year. And that's obviously bond prices coming down, interest rates going higher as the 10 year hits 175. That's what, uh, you know, is the underperformance of, uh, of bonds versus stocks and the index is making new highs is what causes that ratio to go higher, which makes you think as an asset allocator, you're really not getting a lot by, uh, you know, having exposure to bonds. It's that whole 60, 40 split equities to, uh, to fixed income hasn't made a lot of sense because the, the, the returns have come all from the equity side of that, uh, of that scenario. Now, all of a sudden, we're starting to see the benefits of the fixed income exposure with rates actually able to come back down a little bit with bond prices actually starting to rally here. And a couple months ago, you had the bullish momentum divergence on things like the ag and the TLT causing the prices to come higher. It's causing yields to come down. And you can see that now the ratio turning downwards is favoring bonds, favoring the TLT over the SPY. I think this is a key chart to be watching over the next month or two as we're in now really the meat of the seasonally weakest part of the, uh, of the equity uh, annual calendar. Um, do you continue to see uh, stocks underperforming uh, bonds, and if so, think about how you're getting exposure to that relatively defensive part of the uh, of the market. Uh, let's continue on. Just look at the Mindful Investor Live uh, chart list. So, as a reminder, if you've not seen our Friday show before, we always spend some time looking at this group of charts. You can access this uh, as part of your stock charts login. Just go to the Articles tab, uh, and you'll see uh, on the upper right there's a little link from my uh, blog, which is called the Mindful Investor. At the very top of that page. You'll see a gray button for this live chart list. You're welcome to access it right from there. The market trend model, as we uh, often review, is using weekly data, using exponential moving averages based on that weekly data. The long-term model has been positive since June of last year, so now over a year, almost uh, 13 months actually in bullish uh, phase, which is totally appropriate given where we've been. My medium-term model actually turned negative in mid-May, which has been tough to digest as the S&P and the NASDAQ have continued to make new all-time highs. The FANG stocks have you know, broken out to the upside, although that may be in question now. But what that basically tells me is it's a general risk on versus risk off. When that turns negative, that tells me to think more about potential downside than potential upside. It doesn't tell me to you know, try to sell charts like MCO or American Express or Facebook or any of those that are sort of in consistent uptrends that are pushing higher and higher. It tells you to watch out for things that are no longer going up and make sure that you clearly define uh, your risk. And for things like cyclicals that have broken down, the banks and others that are breaking below their 50-day and continuing to push lower, that's what the medium-term trend model being negative tells me to focus on. The short-term model actually finished the week uh, net positive. It was really, really close. And I was curious if it was going to give a negative signal. It really didn't. It's been negative only one week out of the last probably four to five months. So overall, it shows you the strength that we've seen up until uh, today. The daily chart of the S&P, let's spend a moment here. So it's interesting that the S&P made new highs uh, first week in July to the second and third week in July, where we're at now. You can see a bit of a bearish divergence there, not a huge one. I think the ones that you saw in April and January, a little different in terms of indicating uh, a momentum structure over uh, like a three-week period. We weren't quite long enough, I think, to be similar to that. But you know, regardless, we're seeing distribution uh, for uh, for now, the Nasdaq, by the way, clearly in the overbought condition, and now just coming out uh, today from uh, yesterday into today, coming out of that overbought uh, region, which really suggests uh, a pullback imminent. You know, if you look at the chart of the S and P, there are two things that I've been paying attention to very closely. One is a trend line using the October low and the March low that connects very well with May, connects well with June because we broke below it and then traded right back up. We lined up with there in July. We've now tested it yesterday and have now closed below it for only the third time since back in uh, in November, really back here in March is when I first drew this particular trend line once we had that secondary low. So we've only been below it a couple times here. Uh, and so I think leading into next week, that's certainly starting next week in a position of weakness. Now that we've closed below there, the very next thing you look for is follow through. Every other time we've broken that trend line, we very quickly uh, traded back above it. My question is, do we get that sort of positive bounce, much like we did back here in mid-June? If not, you have to start looking at the 50-day moving average, which is currently around 4240. Now, that has been the line in the sand for the S&P 500 going back for the last eight months. It's broken below that 50-day a number of times, never closed below it more than two days in a row, going back to, uh, to last October. So I think 4240 is really the first uh, line of defense here, the first level to uh, to look for. Going into next week, that's where I would be keying in on. If that would fail, we need to look at the swing lows from June and the swing lows from May. And I think 4050 
based on my own analysis, but also based on conversations with guys like Chris this week. Uh, um, who else did we talk to? Larry Tentarelli earlier this week. We talked about that 40, 50 level. Mark Newton, if I remember right, keyed in on that same level. I think a lot of us are keying in on that, those May lows, which means, which tells me if we break below that, that is where you could see a real extended decline, right? At this point, that's like a 7% drop on a lot of charts. That's not the end of the world. That's a decent pullback. You break below that, though, and all of a sudden, this can start to feel like a much deeper and more painful correction. We only have a few moments left here in the Wrap of the Week segment, so I just want to touch on a couple of quick things. This measure of breadth, we've looked at a number of times. The S&P advanced decline line going higher. None of the others confirming the new high in uh, the end of June into July, and two of them now breaking down uh, and breaking below their 50-day moving average, breaking below the June low including the NYSE advanced decline line, which I would argue is the most important. So you have this traditional topping pattern where the breadth uh, is not confirming the most recent upturn, and now you're starting to break down those breadth measures as well. I would argue that's uh, sort of a negative connotation uh, going forward. We talked about bullish percent indexes a lot recently, sort of uh, uh, boiled up here. And, and the fact that the, uh, the bullish percent line on the S&P broke below the 70 level, I think is very, very key. I'd be looking to see next week if we continue to go below there. The real signal that uh, that differentiates a garden variety pullback versus something deeper and more painful in terms of price and or time is this indicator getting below 50%. That would be quite a move from here to get that to be triggered, but that's what I'd be looking for next on this particular chart. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple of quick announcements before we get to the mailbag uh, segment. Number one, we would love to hear your questions. The mailbag that we're going to address here in a moment, these are all questions from you in the last day or two. We would love to keep the dialogue going. Give us your questions, things you're running into as you're analyzing your own charts, questions on particular tickers, particular ratios, market dynamics, news, things you're reading elsewhere, nothing is out of bounds. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. Just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear from you and answer your question in our next Mailmag segment on Tuesday's show. Also, as a reminder, go to stockchartstv.com. Use your email, set up a free account. You can start watching all of our fantastic comment from our great suite of hosts, all of our special events like charting the second half featured on our on-demand platform. Go to stockchartstv.com or look on any of the app stores for Stock Charts TV On Demand. Let's continue on answering your questions from the Final Bar Mailbag. Again, these are all questions that we've received from you in the last uh, day or two. Some really thoughtful questions about market dynamics and technical indicators. Let's get right to it. Question number one, uh, let's see. I was wondering if you can clarify why the short-term moving average crossed below the longer-term moving average uh, on this chart. Let's, let's bring it up. All right, so this was a, a stock that we referred to on the show uh, last week, SQM, which I learned is a Chilean company. Uh, and I mentioned uh, the person that pointed that out, I have very fond memories of going to Santiago. Boy, it's been probably 14 years ago now. It's been too long, but that, that flight, uh, from Buenos Aires over to uh, Santiago is one of the most beautiful uh, flights I've, I've probably ever been on going over the uh, the Andes Mountains, but we digress. Looking at the chart of SQM, how, if the price is coming lower, can the 50-day moving average be crossing, uh, sorry, the 50-week moving average here crossing above the 200-week moving average, which is what you're looking at here. So how can that happen? Well, well quite simply, you know, a lot of times with moving averages, uh, because if you think about what a moving average is, right, the 50-bar moving average this blue point, this point on the current bar is basically a simple average of the last 50 closing uh, prices, right? The last 50 closing prices on these bars that we're looking at, which means if the, if the uh, stock rallies and then starts to come off, this line is going to continue to go higher because the average, the average of the last 50 closes 
continues to go up. And it's less about the new data that's being added by these new weekly closes. It's more about what's rolling off 50 bars ago. Uh, we actually, uh, in my Fidelity days, spent a little more time thinking a lot about not just what was coming into the average, the new data, but what was rolling off. And a lot of times what was rolling off 50 bars ago, 200 bars ago, whatever you're looking at, was is equally as important as the current bar. And so a lot of times it's more about uh, the unwinding of the old data. That's arguably why a lot of people uh, favor things like exponential averages. This is why my market timing model is all driven on exponential averages. They tend to be a little more reactive and, and they're skewed more to the current price data. So it's going to hug the data uh, more recently, uh, more uh, more effectively, more consistently than the simple averages. But that is how and why uh, the price can be coming down, but the moving averages are still sloping upwards because it's, uh, you know, again, this data is actually bringing it down, but it's the data that's rolling off that's causing uh, it to continue to appreciate. Next question, can you cover some of the details about the Ichimoku indicator? Um, boy, in a, in a Q&A segment, tough to do a lot about Ichimoku, but I will show you how to access it, the basic ideas of how to do it. I'm bringing up a chart of Facebook right now, and I'm going over here to overlays. I'm gonna get rid of the existing moving averages that we've had. I'm also going to get rid of the stuff on the bottom, and then I'm going to go to overlays one more time, and I'm going to add Ichimoku Cloud. There are two settings, Ichimoku Cloud and Ichimoku Full. I'll start with the cloud. So Ichimoku charting is a Japanese form of technical analysis. I, I read a lot about it. There's actually very little written in the English language until relatively recently, and people like uh, David Linton, Nicole Elliott, uh, are both uh, based in the UK, have done a great job of of popularizing and writing some of the, the details about these indicators. And there are analysts, um, uh, you know, Katie Stockton comes to mind as someone who uses the cloud uh, uh, pattern very often uh, for good reason. What it, what it basically does is it's one of the few indicators that's actually plotted in the future. So it uses a series of different lines and it's really simple stuff, looking at average closes and looking back, you know, different uh, day counts. I'm, I'm totally glossing over the details, but what it does is it takes the current data and projects, it projects a cloud 26 bars in the future. So what you basically can do and how it's used is you can see if and when Facebook would start to sell off, you can project where it may find support and not on a, a specific price level, something like Fibonacci retracements would give you or support and resistance. It's actually more of a dynamic support based on how quickly something would sell off. And if you look back here, sort of mid 2020, you can see how people often use the cloud. The idea is if we're above the uh, cloud, then the price should find support there. If and when it breaks down through the cloud, it tells you that the conditions are changing. The shape of the cloud is important. So the price above a green cloud is very bullish. A price below a red cloud when it changes is much more negative. And uh, that's kind of the, uh, the whole idea. If you go to the Ichimoku cloud full, you can see some of the indicators that actually are comprised of it. It's actually a relatively busy chart. And there's things called the lagging span, which is the current price plotted 26 days in the past. These two are called the, um, boy, what are these called? These are the two leading spans. This is called the baseline and the conversion line. We're really dragging into my Ichimogu deep uh, technical history here. But, uh, but, but basically, it's a series of three different indicators. You have the cloud, you have the baseline and conversion line, and you have the lagging span. All three of them are used together to give you a full trend following mechanism. If you want more information about it, go to our chart school pages, look for uh, Ichimoku or cloud, and you'll find some uh, information giving you a little more detail about how these are calculated, how you can start to use it. But I would also encourage you to look up people like uh, Katie Stockton, some of the writings from uh, Nicole Elliott and others who have done a really good job describing a lot more of the methodology that goes behind it. Next question, if you have time in the next mailbag segment, could you do a quick analysis of small and mid caps? Uh, I'll take a shot at that. Why not? As we go to, um, you know, IWM tends to be the, uh, the the one that I would use for this. You know, if you look at, we, we tend to look a lot at small versus large uh, very regularly. And part of my main risk on versus risk off assessment includes looking at small caps versus large caps. What's interesting, if you think of the chart of the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, Every month, you've seen higher uh, higher highs, right? Higher closes as the uh, as the um, uh, you know indexes continue to make new all time highs. If you look at the chart of the IWM, you can see new highs in January, February, March, and that's it. We really haven't you know really the acceleration into the February high was the end of small cap outperformance. From then, when we talk about a rotational environment, when we talk about leadership rotation, we talk about a digestion phase. I think the chart of the IWM and the difference leading into mid-February and after mid-February, which has literally been a sideways trend, the absence of up or down. This is 
you know, stocks can go or charts can go up, down or sideways. This is that third direction by far. This is why small caps have been underperforming because other things have gone up. The FANG stocks have gone up while small caps have basically languished. So for me, it's been really difficult to justify small caps on, on a momentum basis over the last couple months because really the momentum hasn't been there. It's been underperforming. It's really been range bound. And until a chart like this breaks out of that range to the upside, you really have to expect that the, the sideways trend uh, continues. Now, I think it's very dangerously at the lower end of this uh, of this, uh, of this this support level, right? This lower end of this range. Right now, the bull case, I would argue, would have to mean the uh, mega cap tech stocks uh, hold up or just pull back a little bit at, at the most. The small caps and others kind of come back a little bit, uh, come down uh, a little bit further. The S&P retraces 7 to 8% more than what it's sold off so far. And then you start to, uh, you know, rotate next higher and you get the big, big leg higher. I think charts like this breaking down out of this range, breaking the 200 day, things like that would be a real negative uh, sign. I don't see the market, uh, you know, moving dramatically higher given that sort of breakdown. So I would argue while the S&P is always an important chart to look at, I would argue the small cap chart uh, also maybe equally or if not a little more important uh, right now. Um, boy, we only have time for like one more question that we really have to go. I talked about the bullish percent index and uh, someone asked about this. This is where we'll, ha we'll have to uh, to leave it for today. If you look at a chart of the XLF, you had some indicators down at the bottom and you had this particular thing where we were doing BPFINA, which is the ticker for the financial bullish percent index, the S&P members uh, and whether they're uh, bullish or, uh, or bearish right now. And you said my chart, it's doing this weird thing. We're showing negative 32%. Why is it giving me that weird value as opposed to just showing you from zero to 100 percent the actual value? The reason is because you're using this uh, indicator called price hyphen performance. You want to change that to price where you're not looking at performance trends over time. You're just looking at the actual value that's going to make a little more sense in terms of the actual value. You also ask, can we automate that? So bring up utilities and have it automatically show the bullish percent for utilities. Not yet. So I've actually created a chart list with the 11 S&P sectors and each of their bullish percent indexes. I would encourage you to do the same. If you want my list, no problem. Shoot me an email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. I'm happy to send that list right to your stock charts login. We need to wrap the show though today. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the S&P breadth by cap tiers. This is a chart we refer to very regularly. And I would, I, you know, sometimes it's kind of boring. So in April, when most things were going higher in March, when they're all making new highs, there's not a lot of signal there. I think this is one of those times where the breadth indicator is, is giving a strong signal. And while I've hesitated to be too negative, I think at this point, the potential to move lower in terms of time and or price in a major way starting next week and following through from what we saw this week is very, very real. And I would say this is one of the charts that we may look back and, and, and recognize that it gave us clear topping signals. The fact that the uh, NYSE all, uh, advanced decline line has made a new swing low after breaking below its 50-day while the S&P is still making new highs, that is exactly what happened at the, at the February 2020 high. This is a chart I'm going to be watching to see if breadth conditions can recover at all, but so far not the case. Chart number two is looking at high beta versus low vol. So if you know these ETFs, high beta is really in cyclicals right now, financials, industrials, low vol are things like utilities and real estate, very defensive. Overall, this ratio was in an outperformance mode for high beta as the cyclicals were leading into the first quarter. From there, it's really been sideways. And when we talk about a rotational environment, this is a great chart that shows that rotation where it's been leadership in fits and starts, but overall it's been sideways. These have overall been rotating back and forth. As of today, this ratio is breaking down as investors are finally getting more into the defensive side of the coin. That is a chart to continue to watch to see if defensive sectors like utilities continue to do well. Finally, a chart like Moderna breaking out to the upside. Not a lot of stocks breaking out to the upside uh, today and this week. This is certainly a chart to watch up 10% today. What concerns me, a potential exhaustion gaps. There's three types of gaps. The one that happens after a big move could be an exhaustion gap as it's overbought. I would be looking at this chart into next week to see what sort of follow, get, follow through we get after this big gap higher on Friday session. Okay. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us today and every day. Uh, every weekday after the close for the final bar. As a reminder, send us an email with any questions that you have, the final bar at stockcharts.com. We would love to hear from you. From everyone here at stockcharts.com, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with stockcharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, 
Hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.